I hope you I hope you made good use of this five minute break. Tatanka Bricka, uh, are you with us? Yes, I'm with you. I just want to show while we can. This is my oh, it disappeared somehow. This is my absentee ballot in California for the governor's race. I will be filing it. Uh, I just wanted to preserve it for this call. Tatanka, you are also in California and you have a great, great lineup on the environment. So please uh, take it away. Thank you, Harvey. Welcome everybody to the environmental section. I wanna welcome my co-host, Nat Farfan. I saw you come in a while ago. Are you here, Nat? Please come and be with me, my co-moderator. Okay, says so she's the co-host now. So we have an incredible group of speakers here. I do wanna let the tech people know. That, welcome, Nat. Thank you. Yes, I do wanna let the tech people know that um, Denny Zane, former mayor of Santa Monica and uh, head of Move LA is one of two of our speakers that is being told when he comes in now that it's reached attendance limit and he can't get in. So I just wanna let the tech people know that. I know that's not the case, but it's happening to people on the link now. Okay, so um, welcome everyone to this call. I want, uh, Nat and I have uh, two and a half minutes each to introduce ourselves, and then we have a great panel of people. So um, I'll go first, and then I'll introduce you, Nat, unless you wanna go first. Okay, so I am presently working as a volunteer on this angle with the Romero Institute of California in Santa Cruz with Danny Sheehan, Sarah Nelson, Ben Eichert, and team. We have teamed up now with Dolores Huerta and Lori Pesante and Camila Chavez and the entire team of the Dolores Huerta Foundation who are partnering with us to get a California Green New Deal passed. In the midst of this, we have a recall election, a very anti-democratic measure basically aimed, I believe, at us because a lot of Exxon money going into this and so we urge everyone in the state of California to vote, I'm vote no that. on that recall. It is imperative that we have a democratic governor in office. So when we pass this next year, he will sign it into law. The present rules are such if the election were held today and the election is less than three weeks away, that in fact, it's only two weeks away, that someone with 10% of the vote would beat Governor Newsom with 48% unless we get one vote over 50%. It's critical that people show up and understand those issues. It's, a, it's, it's the subterfuge they're using. They can't win in 2022 or 2024, so they're going to this. All right, so um, I am going to now introduce um, Nat Farfan. Nat, will you introduce yourself, please? And then we will get on with the uh, process. Absolutely. Hi, everyone. Um, welcome and thank you for joining us. I'm honored to be here myself. Dolores Huerta is someone I look up to and I look up to all of you here actually trying to move this legislation forward. Um, I am part of the Coalition um, of Indigenous Peoples Movement. I'm a water protector and I am here to help in any way that I can. Thank you very much, Nat. I am now going to introduce the Reverend Deborah Johnson. Are you with us, Deborah? Rev D? She is I not. She is not. Oh, wow. She's one of the many who couldn't get in. Okay. So if she comes in later, please let me know. Uh, next, is Heather Booth among us? Yes, she is. Okay, Heather. And I see Welcome. my champion, Andrea Miller, and it's spectacular to be uh, part of this lineup, this amazing group uh, on this round table, both the speakers, the organizers, including my longtime friend, Joel Siegel, but also the participants, the 190 and more people who are listening in of those who could get in. It's your organizing and the millions others around the country that brought us to a historic moment to make amongst the greatest change that we've ever had in at least my lifetime, which is now 75 years. We stand to have investment in our communities of $3.5 trillion, including 
a civilian climate corps, corps that uh, Alexandria Cortez uh, has promoted as well as Senator Sanders for cutting child poverty in half with the extension of the child tax credits for senior care, expanding Medicare, for good paying jobs, a pathway to citizenship and taxing the ultra wealthy to make them pay for it and pay their fair share. All of this is possible because of the organizing that you've all been doing. We also see the uh, advances we've been making towards democracy and expanding democracy, which we need to do in the demonstrations last week. But we're also on a knife edge because if we don't seize the moment and keep organizing, we'll end up with the Jim Crow insurrectionists who seek to limit our vote, ignore climate change, and extend the racial and economic inequality that's destroying lives right now around the country. It is up to us. It is whether we move for our hopes or our fears. All of this gets focused through the electoral process also as we move our power in the streets, also into elections. And the 2022 elections are already upon us. There are already states where Republican controlled legislatures are redistricting in order to deny our votes and deny our ability to vote. In Georgia, as you well know, they're uh, even denying the right to provide water for those standing in line uh, to vote. And I thought one of the civil disobedience actions we might consider is getting thousands of people and lawyers ready to provide water for those standing in line to vote and let them come after us. It's one thing to arrest one, but two, but thousands, and we can challenge these laws. It all depends on what we do. All of you on the call, you've helped to bring us to this point. And now we can change history if we continue to organize, build our electoral power and act together. Thank you for the summit. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you for moderating this. Thank you, Heather, founder of Citizen Action. Um, I'm gonna introduce the first three and then Nat will follow with the next three. Emily Wirth, Food and Water Watch, are you among us? Yes, I'm here. Terrific, you're on. Good afternoon. Thank you so much to everyone who organized this event. It's really an honor to be here um, with so many amazing allies fighting for a livable climate for not only for all of us, but for future generations. So I'm the organizing director at the nonprofit organization Food and Water Watch. We work to protect our essential food and water resources, but we see climate as a critical threat to both food and water. And so we've been working over the past decade to move our elected officials to support policies to stop the extraction and use of fossil fuels and move us to 100% renewable energy future. We really are putting our organizing energy into stopping fracking for oil and gas, all these new fossil fuel infrastructure projects that disproportionately harm low income communities and communities of color. Because as a recent IPPC report made clear, we simply cannot afford to appease the fossil fuel industry and build more fossil fuel projects if we're going to abate catastrophic climate change and what we're already seeing around us with horrific hurricanes, wildfires, and droughts. One thing we're doing that absolutely cannot continue is the subsidizing of this mature fossil fuel industry. We are giving $15 billion of government financial support each year to the fossil fuel industry. And right now, this critical um, opportunity that Heather just talked about in this budget reconciliation bill gives us an opportunity to try to get fossil fuel subsidies removed um, as part of this, this bill moving through Congress. Um, but what we know and what recent video from an Exxon lobbyist made clear is that the fossil fuel industry is going to do everything they can to stop that from happening. Um, and so we need to, they're going to meet with um, members of Congress and use all of their mechanisms to have control over what's happening. So it's really up to us at this critical time to remind our elected officials that they work for us, not the fossil fuel industry. Um, and that we need them to take this really important step as part of this budget reconciliation bill. So I'm really excited to share that at Food and Water Watch, we recently launched a climate liaison program with our longtime incredible ally, Progressive Democrats of America. Through this program, we're identifying people who regularly, who will 
agreed or regularly and persistently meet with their members of Congress to push for the kind of bold climate policies that the science supports. Um, and in the short term, that's removing fossil fuel subsidies through this budget reconciliation bill. This program really comes from a long-term um, uh, general congressional liaison program that PDA has started. And so what we're doing is just really focusing in on climate and climate policy and working together to ensure that all of the people willing to take on um, becoming a regular liaison with their member of Congress have all of the background and information that they need to advocate for these policies and that they have all the latest information about what's going on with the timing of the legislation. So this is just getting started. We're really excited about it um, and would love for people to get more involved um, so that we can really make progress on changing um, climate policy before it's too late. And so I know um, the amazing Alan Minsky with PDA is going to be part of this panel. He's going to share more information, including a sign up link he just put in the chat. And I encourage everyone to join us um, and at minimum contact your member of Congress and ask them to support removing um, fossil fuel subsidies as part of this budget reconciliation bill. So thank, thank you, you all so much. much. Yeah. Thank you, Emily. I am going to use this at, at two minutes and then at two and a half minutes. And at two and a half minutes, you need to sum up. Okay, thank you very much. We're all doing very well. Our next speaker um, was supposed to be Dolores, but we, pay, we played her three minute video at the very beginning of this. So we're not gonna use that. Betsy Nichols, of, or sorry, Josiah Edwards of Sunrise, Los Angeles. Are you with us, Josiah? I am. Terrific, you're up. Hi everyone. As introduced, my name is Josiah Edwards. I'm 21 years old and I'm a member of Sunrise Movement, a movement of young people dedicated to stopping climate change and creating millions of good jobs in the process. From our birth in 2017 to today, we have fought to make the Green New Deal a political reality. And our efforts like our 2018 sit-in in Nancy Pelosi's office or our recent shutdown of the White House have succeeded in making Green New Deal legislation among the most popular in the country. Climate change is a reality that we cannot avoid. Turn on the television or hop on social media to see the devastation wrought by climate change. We are living through the crisis right now and young people will bear the burden. <laughs> As Hurricane Ida batters the Gulf South and wildfires rage in my home state of California, we see more so now more than ever, the need for our political leaders to act with the urgency necessary to meet the scale of the crisis. Our futures are not political footballs. We deserve the opportunity to live whole and fulfilling lives. That's why we embarked on a campaign called Good Jobs for All, where we demanded President Biden fight for a bold, fully funded civilian climate corps that would employ 1.5 million Americans with good paying union jobs to build new climate resilient infrastructure to take care of each other. It would begin the decade of a Green New Deal and set us on the path toward protecting our communities and loved ones. It would restore a faith in government which had long been lost because of the failures of past leaders to act with the ambition and, and, and urgency necessary and listen to the cries of Americans who have long suffered because of government inaction. Listen, I myself have been the victim of environmental racism. I, I grew up with childhood asthma. My father and brother still have asthma. I remember the frequency with which I would have nosebleeds that were completely random and unexplainable. It was only until I was older that I understood that the refineries in my community, which are responsible for perpetuating the crisis that we are in now, are, were also responsible for putting my health at risk, for putting my family and community's health at risk. We're fed up. We are tired of our so-called leaders compromising with white supremacist insurrectionists who have actively advanced an anti-democratic agenda. We're tired of the people who should be on our side like Joe Manchin and Kirsten Sinema working to advance the agenda and interests of corporate fossil fuel money as opposed to those of us who elected them. We've had enough and this $3.5 trillion infrastructure package must move forward because it's the first step to a Green New Deal. The reason we need a united progressive movement is because they can no longer stymie the people's agenda. Our struggles are intertwined. The fight for racial justice is a fight for climate justice. It's a fight for healthcare justice. It's a fight for economic justice. 
as we continue to fight against the unjustness of society, as our movement shows up alongside indigenous water protectors to stop line three, as we continue to demand a fully funded civilian climate corps, let's remember that change can't occur until we center those of us on the margins, black and brown communities, the poor, the working poor and the barely middle class. So I wanna thank you, Joe Segal, for bringing all of us together to elevate the fight for justice for all. Thank you. Thank you, Josiah. Very good. We, it's so good to see so many young leaders in our movement. Those of us that are older are, are very willing to share and some of us even pass the torch. Now I'm gonna pass back to my co-host, Nat Farfan, to introduce three more folks. Thank you, and I, I echo that. Josiah and all the youth keep coming forward. We need that. Um, next is Betsy Nichols from River Keepers Chesapeake Bay. Betsy, are you on? Yes, I'm here. Um, my name is Betsy Nicholas. I'm executive director of Water Keepers Chesapeake. Same idea though, River Keepers, Water Keepers, we're all the same thing. Um, and I'm gonna take things a little bit more to the ground level. Uh, we work in our communities, in our local communities. And I can just tell you what I was doing this morning over on the Eastern shore of the Chesapeake Bay in order to just drive back uh, to where I live over on the Western shore, I had to go through about 16 different flooded areas on roads. And that's just from normal storms that are going on. But right now we have a problem that this is the reality of everyone on the East Coast, but in our region, in the mid-Atlantic states, people through no fault of their own, nothing they have done wrong, have their homes flooded consistently, filling up their basements with raw sewage. And looking around, nobody's taking responsibility. We have a failure at all levels of government here, from the federal down to the local government. And not only are they failing to take responsibility, they're continuing to allow development that's gonna hurt other families and communities that have been here. The data being used for permitting in this country is 30 to 50 years old. So even if you say that you're in compliance with permits under the Clean Water Act, Clean Air Act, or anything else, the data that's being used isn't useful or reliable. We have areas that have flooded with thousand year storms three times in a decade. This is unacceptable. People dying and losing their homes on a regular basis. Just what's happened in the past two weeks across this country in Tennessee and now in New Orleans, looking at what we're facing, and yet we still don't have the action we need at the state level and at the local level. So this year, we got a little frustrated with this and put in a new state bill requiring the use of updated data and actually we're able to get it to pass. And what this means is that for all of the Clean Water Act permits, for stormwater permits, you actually have to use current rainfall data um, rather than allowing construction unfettered to go forward using data that's more than 30 years old and controlling the inappropriate amount of stormwater and storm volume in particular. The management of water across this country from the flooding on the East Coast to the fires on the West Coast, all uh, furthered by climate change, are having really disproportionate impacts and killing some, while others make millions and more profit. So we need to get on the ground level, working in our state and local governments, to get measures to deal with the adaptation, the implementation of these laws right now, while partnering with all the people who are working on the federal level to change the bigger structure. But we have to get some relief on the ground to make it so that we're not losing entire communities through climate change and the impacts that has on water and development and, um, and their public health. So that's where we're really focused right now. And we wanna try and partner with all of the folks working at the federal level so we can have these climate solutions that make sense both at the federal level and then on the ground in our local communities. Thank you, Betsy. Great information there. Um, is there, Juka, we're going on to the next speaker. Um, Denny, Denny Zane, former mayor of Santa Monica. Uh, he, can't, he can't get in, so he's no not worries. on the call. No worries. How about Hope Kanoi from Indigenous Visions? Josie's got to leave at four o'clock. 
Okay, no worries. We'll move on to the next speaker. It's um, Alan Minsky. Alan Minsky from Progressive Democrats of America. Um, hello, everybody, and and uh, thank you very much. And I first of all want to thank, uh, of course, thank you, Nat, and thank you, uh, Tatanka, and to Joel Siegel and Andrea Miller and uh, Harvey Wasserman and Mike Hirsch and Mike Fox and all the people who put this together. I wanna to thank you so much. And I wanna spend my time actually uh, in honor of uh, Heather Ruth in particular, doing some organizing here. And, and so as, as uh, Emily mentioned earlier, we are partnering with Food and Water Watch on this project to have congressional climate liaisons that parallels our national uh, congressional liaison program, but to focus in on the uh, issues addressed uh, at the top by the federal government in terms of uh, climate related policy, and in particular, uh, the need to develop renewable energy to completely replace fossil fuel use and other dirty energy product projects. And I do wanna state right at the top, yes, we understand there are a number of environmental organizations that do not hold the line of being 100% zero fossil fuels. That's the one stipulation that people should understand when they sign up for this project. Food and Water Watch and PDA were both very committed to being 100% fossil fuel free and supporting solutions that are completely renewable energy, not cleaner energy, not you know, drawing on natural gas production, but truly renewable, 100% zero fossil fuel free and non-nuclear uh, solutions to um, the energy systems and how energy is used in the United States of America. Um, and so that's the stipulation if you're interested in participating in this project. And just to clarify, we really feel both organizations that, you know, uh, there have been approaches that have been embraced, for instance, by the fossil fuel industry that just lowers the level of fossil fuel production or proposes the lowering of it. And that's been tried now for decades and has gotten us pretty much nowhere. And I think if we fast forward five years and 10 years, We'll, we'll be in a position where everybody will be at the position that we're at now because we have to stop using fossil fuels. There's no two ways around it. Now we do understand and we're very sensitive to what this means in terms of communities, often not wealthy communities, often communities of color where there's a concentrated no, amount of employment in the fossil fuel industry. So we are also equally committed to making the term just transition, not a hollow slogan but making it a reality, even understanding what that means in terms of the complexities of US labor law. So we're fully committed to just transition. We're fully committed to 100% zero fossil fuel use. Uh, again, here is the sign up sheet again, with the idea here being about organizing, please sign up. Now in terms of local matters, of course, the local liaisons will have the capacity. Alan, we, we need to go on to other speakers where our time- Oh, is I'm already at time. Well, there we are. Again, there'll be local input, of course, anti-environmental racism, of course, please sign up, join it. And yes, we of course need to always diversify the climate movement as much as we can. Please sign up. Thank you for us. all your work, Thank Alan. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. Thank you. So thank I should I take the next guest? Yeah, take take Rudy and then I'll do, uh, or do you want me to, or do you? Add, okay. add to Rudy. Uh, yeah, do Rudy Arredondo, president of National Latino Farmers and Ranchers Trade Association. Rudy, are you with us? Yes, I am. Thank you very well, much to everyone and all my brethren and my sisters that are uh, part of this uh, summit. I really want to thank uh, Joel to, uh, who has worked with me. And one of the things that have a great concern to, to, to us is, you know, we represent farmers and we are in a dire crisis and we are concerned with regard to the fact that the politicians are not going to resolve our issues. We have to do it ourselves. And so this is one of the reasons that, uh, you know, I really sign on with, with uh, Joel because we need to take this into our own hands and do what it is to be done. Droughts, food, uh, food shortages are going to be very common. 30% of the Central Valley in California uh, the farmers tell me that they are going to have 30% of their land lay fallow. It's not going to be planted as a result of the uh, a drought, the flooding, <clears throat> the wildfires that are taking place there. Uh, uh, some of our, our ranchers, they're going to be, they're either selling their, their, their herds and or 
they're going to be reducing because there isn't enough grazing for them to be able to, to feed their cattle. So we are very concerned about the fact that in spite of this crisis situation that we're in, exacerbated by the pandemic, and it was blatantly clear as, as we have been trying to get into this uh, meeting, that the technology is not as uh, efficient or available as, as we need to, it to be, not to mention in the rural communities, it's non-existent. So we're working toward that end. And I really appreciate and hope that we can get, uh, uh, we can all get behind trying to get our issues resolved. Like I said, we are the farmer, we're the people that feed you. And if you are going to be uh, a part of this, it's important that you take that into mind. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Rudy. Thank you. I want to remind everybody, this is just a taste of people. So next speaker, Magdaleno Rosavila. Join us, Leno. I'm uh, Magdaleno Leno Rose Avila, a human rights activist working. Uh, I'm getting all these messages on my computer. I'm uh, Magdaleno Leno Rose Avila, a human rights activist working with immigrants, organizing to protect our right to vote and our democracy, and doing all in my power to protect Mother Earth and all our creatures. Now, today, I must tell you that history can't wait. You must do today what is needed. You cannot wait until tomorrow. History is being made today. And while it is always good to be on the right side of history, it's even better to make history. And you know that climate change is real. People are suffering because of droughts and immigrants are coming north because their crops are failing. Others are having their lives destroyed by too much rain, wildfires from hell and historic storms. And this is the result of climate change. And now we must work together to protect Mother Earth. Our enemies are powerful. They have money, they have no conscience, and they will tell any lie in order to oppress the truth and human rights. Yesterday, we all did great work and we should be proud of that. But today we need to do more and we need to do it better. We need to find new tactics and strategies and we must embrace our young leaders. Together, we must take the brave steps into the future. The enemies of freedom, they go crazy when they see us working and marching together. It drives them nuts. So let's join forces and drive them crazier than crazy can be. I'm sure you all heard of the biblical story of David and Goliath and how this small man brought down a giant warrior. And as you know, in those days, men wrote all the books. And what if women were writing the books at that time? It might have been said that Diana brought down Goliath, but that really doesn't matter now because we need both David and Diana to bring justice to America. We must build the best, strongest, most creative, and most inclusive coalition ever seen in this world. And we need your voice and leadership now. Remember, it's not about how long you lived, but what you did when you were alive. It's not about the promises you made, but the promises you keep. Today, you must raise your voice. And as Bob Marty said, get up, stand up, stand up for your rights. Get up, stand up, don't give up the fight. Join us and our coalition on the road to freedom. And remember, history can't wait. History can't wait. Thank you, Leno. Bless you. Si se puede. Um, I need some advice from tech because we have Harvey Wasserman, Eva K. Lee, Drew Glover, and Molly Baszler to continue. What is our timing? We're good. We're good. Let's okay, do great. Let's You're do up, it. Harvey. <clears throat> okay, so I, I changed my no nuke shirt. <clears throat> we, I'm going to very quickly say that we can't just stop fossil fuels. Uh, we do not cool this planet with radioactive fires that burn <clears throat> at uh, uh, 350 degrees Fahrenheit. This is not, this does not work. 
uh, neither with uh, thorium, which burns at 1100, and with fusion that burns at 100 million, believe it or not. We have all the energy need, we need with renewables, solar, wind, tidal, geothermal, ocean thermal. They all have to be done environmentally responsible, but with batteries and increased efficiency, switching to electric cars. <clears throat> there will actually be in October near Seattle, the first flight of an electric powered air, uh, passenger airplane. So we, we are, the possibilities are endless and we have the technology. We have the technology to save this world it, or at least to save our place on it. Let's put it that way. The world is gonna go on, yours is gonna go on without us. If we, if, but if we blow ourselves off the planet, that's, that, there's no excuse. We, we have the ability with organic gardening and farming with, uh, with more and more veganism and uh, all the other things we need. But the key we need is the key, which is the raison d'etre for this phone call, which is broad-based, as Joel would say, unified progressive action. We need to get out of our silos, both our grain silos and our missile silos, and get into a completely unified movement. So if, those of us who don't think you can make a difference, I lived on a communal hippie farm in 19, uh, in the 1970s, they came in and said they were gonna build a nuclear plant four miles from our house. We said, no, you're not. We stopped them. Richard Nixon said there'd be a thousand nuclear plants in the United States by the year 2000, there were 104. I've posted, and now, now there are 93, and we need to knock that number down to zero. After Fukushima, Chernobyl, Three Mile Island, we know what comes next. We've got to shut all of these reactors as soon as possible and go 100% renewable uh, to solar topia. And we can do it. And this call is really the first step to the broad based coalition we need to have. So thank you, Joel. And thank you also, by the way, for Smart Alec. We're going to start drafting legislation that's going to make solar topia possible. Okay, you guys. I don't know if I talked fast enough but I'll see you uh, in a few minutes. Thank, Thank you. you. Harvey Sluggo, you're our leader, man. Thank you. That's wonderful. Um, I pass it back to you, Nat. We have three more speakers. All right. Well, thank you again, Harvey. That was amazing. Um, next speaker on board is Eva K. Lee, professor of science and engineering at Georgia Tech, also an expert on clean renewable energy. Eva, are you on with us? Yes, I am. Awesome, welcome. And thank you. Thank you. I think, um, well, I have to thank Joe for really putting me on with all these great passionate leaders, um, young and, and experienced leaders. I think uh, this is really wonderful. So I am an engineering professor and directing the Center for Operations Research in Medicine and Healthcare. And really my passion and my work really focus on advancing healthcare and really providing that service for all people and really including all the underserved and as well as people that really cannot afford to pay because I do believe that healthcare is a service. It really is supposed to be for everyone. So that's really important. And I'm also very passionate about the nature oriented energy resources. Everything that Harvey and Alan talk about exactly solar and wind and hydro and how to optimize them and make that available to all walks of people. The extreme climate causes like many, many avoidable health problems and it is also destroying the planet Earth. So this is really important that we really look at this problem and try to come up with solutions because we've talked about that for a long time and it is the actions that matter and it is how it is going to really make changes in our life. So I, I love that some of the, the experts talk about data and my work really use data to analyze risk and also decision analysis like machine learning and all of these things and how cognitive and human behavior intertwine with it and how do we optimize resources and truly on the ground i really love what harvey just mentioned about the nuclear energy i was on the ground in fukushima and helping them with the um disasters the nuclear disasters and also helping them to really um like how do you optimize the um resources of all type of energies and replace the nuclear energy by the 
green energy. I think that's really important. One of the really the project that we have done is to build a hundred bed hospital in California that uses all green energy and have zero carbon footprint. And it is possible, absolutely possible. In fact, amazingly, it's cheaper and it is safer. Of course, it is much better to the environment. So I think this is something that we all could do. And I really think that um, educating the young generation and that's part of what I do. And I think it's, it's wonderful because I think they are the future and everything that we do, I think that's really the, the, the way to go. And I devote my energy and skills really looking at solutions to save the planet Earth and educating all these uh, next generation leaders. So it is an honor for me to have the opportunity to meet all of you and great people. I am a little dot and, and I look forward to working with you all. Thank you. Thank you, Eva, and great information. Um, we're on to the next speaker, um, and it is Drew Glover. Drew, are you on? I am. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Welcome. Great, thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Drew Glover. I'm coming to you from Selma, Alabama. You'll have to excuse my connection because of the hurricane down in the Gulf Coast always impacts the infrastructure in, uh, in Alabama, which is very in line with everything that people have been talking about up to me, which I thought was really appropriate. Uh, today, I want to spend a little bit of time talking about creating alternative systems, which is a fantastic nonviolent way to fight against the system and make the change happen in your own community. I am a board member and owner of the operator, owner member of a local food cooperative. It's actually called the Local Farm Food Cooperative in Selma, Alabama. We're based in a small half acre piece of land over in a place called the Mill Village neighborhood in the center of a community. And the goal here is to create alternative food systems that teach people the food cycle, the way they can get involved in growing their own food, as well as food preservation, food preparation, and healthy eating habits that are available in places like Selma, which is a food desert. Very limited access to organic and fresh vegetables, very limited access to that kind of um, emphasis and education. So it's a great opportunity with these alternative systems and creating of cooperatives to provide people those options and skill sets. I think along with that and climate change, we just heard from Rudy Arredondo, the president of the farmers group, and he's talking about the concerns that farmers feel, whether it be the hurricanes, the heat domes, the wildfires, that's going to directly impact our food systems, accessibility to food and food costs. So we need to be developing alternative systems to alleviate that because we all know that the people that suffer most from climate change and those issues are people and members of the global majority. So we need to take action at every step of the way from the grassroots up until the elected offices to make that happen. I'm working with a diverse group of young folks. You heard from one of them earlier today, Natalie Fashon with The Ride Revived. So if you're interested in getting involved, learning more about that, learning more about the work that we do here in Selma, or learning about how to start a co-op of your own, you can contact me. My email's in the thread somewhere. But thanks a lot for the opportunity. Everyone's doing a fantastic job. Thanks to the organizers. This is great. And let's continue the work, because it's only through these conversations that we're going to be able to make stuff happen. Wow. Thank you, Drew. Thank you. Thank you, Drew. I appreciate that. Lots of great information there. Um, and last but not least on our speaker is Molly Baisner, LA City Council candidate. Molly, are you on? Yes, I'm here. Thank you very much. And Welcome. it's Baisler. My name is Molly Baisler. Laser. And I, I believe that we need a united progressive movement network coalition. That is why I'm here. I'm honored to be here. Um, I'm an activist, community organizer, environmentalist, animal activist, um, and I'm, I'm so passionate about changing uh, the world, the planet, Los Angeles, our local government that I am run, I've stepped in to run for office. I'm running for Los Angeles City Council District 5. We need to change our local government and uh, move in to a progressive world, right? So we need to change everything. And I believe one of the ways to do it is to step into leadership roles. 
Um, I'm going up against the political machine. I am the progressive grassroots candidate, people powered. I'm not taking special interest money. So I need all the support I can get. I'm also running a green and regenerative campaign. And I'm asking my fellow candidates to do the same, a green challenge. What does that look like? It means less paper, no plastic at my events. Um, no meat and dairy at my events, none of these, all of these ridiculous paper things we send out. Um, we have to come up with new and innovative ways to campaign, to move through the world so we have a planet to continue to live here. We have passed the point of no return. The IPCC, the Intergovernment Panel of Climate Change has reported we have overheated, right? Our planet is too hot. Now, all we, now what we have to do is not make it worse. And we are, we are on a trajectory of, of extinction. So we really have to step up, step into uh, positions of power so we can take the lead. Um, and that is why I'm running. So I'd really love your support. I'm also a climate reality leader. I've been doing this about five years now. And like I said, then decided to step into a place of leadership. So my platform, so I have a bigger voice and, um, and, and possibly to create bigger changes because it's not the speeches we make, it's the actions we take. And um, I ask for your support and I'm glad to be here. Thank you. Molly Blazer, thank you so much. Put yourself in the chat, Molly. Thank you so much, Molly, and thank you all the speakers. Nat, will you want to have, give a reflection at the uh, end of our speakers list on, on what we heard? I'll do the same, and then we'll pass it on to the next act. Absolutely. Again, I want to say thank you to everyone who's joined us, who has a voice, youth, all the way to the elders. Um, this is a widespread feeling among all of us progressive leaders, civic leaders, activists, um, and again, it starts with dismantling power structures, um, or as Mark Carlin said, he's editor of Buzz Flash on this commentary, we need to be unrelenting in advancing a progressive agenda that results in changing hearts, minds, and most importantly, legislation. So the journey continues. I look forward to moving from trauma to sacredness. Again, I'm Nat, I'm representing Indigenous Peoples Movement Coalition. Thank you, Nat. It's been a pleasure working with you. And thank you, all the speakers. I mean, what I'm getting is that everybody is validating that we really do need this kind of progressive organized movement. I mean, as organized as a progressive movement can be to get legislation <laughs> done and to get things done. I know Harvey's laughing. We have a, a variety of uh, governance styles here, but I like the, the discipline of actually getting things done on time and laughing and uh, supporting each other while we're doing it. Harvey, do you have any thought? And then I'm gonna pass it on. Well, you've been absolutely great, Tatanka. Both of you are fantastic, uh, Nat. And um, you know, this is a dream come true. We're actually not uh, far behind schedule at all. If you look at the, we were gonna finish at 420 uh, for, with your section. Uh, we, we have the tools here to protect the environment. I wanna point out to everybody, this is a moment and a movement. So we're gonna be doing this for the next three years at least. We need your contacts so that when we call the next uh, a gathering, we can you can turn around and email to your lists. That's absolutely essential. We still have 160 people on after uh, three and a half hours. <laughs> That's pretty amazing, actually, when you think about it. But we, we know we can get more. We need to be able to contact everybody on this list. <clears throat> I have actually, I'm finishing a, a history of the United States as an environmental uh, activist history. Uh, Joel has read it and he passed the quiz that I gave him afterwards. It's called The People's Spiral of US History. I will send you a free PDF if you email me at solartopia at gmail.com. But Tataka and Nan, you did a beautiful job, Senator Brown as well. And we are gonna continue this next month. We will do DC Statehood. The month after, we'll come back to the to election protection, then the environment, then social justice. And then in January, we'll have another one of these national gatherings. And I by wanna, then, if we Harvey, I want to interrupt for a second. Yes. I just want to encourage everyone here, if you get a spark of an idea for a roundtable, I'm particularly yes. addressing this to, to uh, people of color and disadvantage and youth, youth 
If you have an idea, please share it with us. This is our movement. This is our forum. So as Harvey says, we are combining moments to create a movement. And we, need, we will continue to do those moments indefinitely. And as Molly and everybody said, we are in an extinction event. I just want to state that there are scientists we heard of on our Zoom call with Danny Sheehan of Romero Institute that the timing for the release at this moment with the way the planet is heating up, the release of the giant plumes of methane from the north and the impact that it will have, the, one of the impacts it will have is it will take the entire equatorial region of our earth, including the Amazon, and turn it from a net drawdown of carbon creating all that beautiful weather to a net addition. And the timing they've put on the, the methane release with that process starting is 2026. Okay, this is worse than the IPCC report, but we have our work to do. So we're, we're thinking about how we can get our 10 year Green New Deal down to a five year Green New Deal. All right, I'm gonna pass the next, but we humans, we created these problems. Let's get together and solve them. Hey, back to you, Joel Siegel for the next segment. Hello, thank you, Tatanka. Thank you, um, beautiful job, Tatanka, Harvey, and uh, your entire panel. I want to say that one of the goals of the National Justice Roundtable is to create a beloved community. And we, we really have found a beloved community here. We're not just activists. We're family, friends, and colleagues. And, you know, that's the only way you can really transform uh, this country and the world is you have to start by being a family. I call it Thanksgiving organizing or Hanukkah organizing. <laughs> and uh, hey, Nat, great, that great job, Nat. I look forward to meeting you. Thank um, you, Joe. The, Yeah, you're welcome. Um, let's see, the next panel is um, ending homelessness, poverty, and social and economic justice. I just want to see if, does Donald Whitehead with us? Executive Director of the National Coalition? No, he is not. No, he is. Okay. Well, then um, I know we have Rajni, right? Shekhar Brown? Yep, you do. Okay. First of all, before we start, um, I need to thank Andrea Miller, Mike Hirsch, Stephen Caruso. Without them, there is no way we could have um, produced this incredible, you know, run of show. And these are the heroes you know, of movements. It's the people who are in the background, but without them, there's no way we could have done this um, incredible. Uh, Donald's here. The great speakers. Donald is here. Oh, Donald's here? Donald's here. Okay. Yep. I'm just going to brief statement, and then I'm going to introduce our incredible moderators. Joel, let me jump in real quick. Procedurally, uh, you're going to do this magnificent panel on uh, social justice uh, and ending homelessness and poverty. When it's done, those of you who want to speak up, we are going to have a lasagna hour, which was going to be the last hour of our in-person uh, meeting, and everybody will have a chance to speak. So this panel coming up on social justice is going to be spectacular. I want to remind people that Joel is the founder of the Smart Alec, who is going to be drafting our, our legislation. And, and everybody, once this panel is over, in our lasagna hour, which will be engineered by Steve Caruso, we are going to uh, have an open forum. So stick around for that, if you will. And uh, Joel, it's all yours. Thank you very much, Lago. Um, we were going to show a video for, from the National Coalition for the Homeless. Unfortunately, because of some technical issues, we will not be able to show that. But when we do the next round table, that National Coalition for the Homeless is going to spearhead on ending homelessness and how we're going to do that, we will have the opportunity to do that. Um, Naomi Klein, in her seminal work, This Changes Everything, said that if we're going to address climate change and go to 100% clean renewable energy, we at the same time can have the objective of ending poverty. There is no reason to accept poverty and homelessness. Why? Because as someone who experienced poverty and homelessness myself and who deals with homeless people almost every day, it is unconscionable in the richest country in the world to have one person to be houseless and unhoused. That started from Ronald Reagan in 81 to 85, an $80 billion cut in affordable housing. 
And that is one of the reasons why where I live in Charlotte, we can't afford to build housing because we need federal dollars. And what I think Rajni and um, Donald are doing, they are spearheading the second attempt to end homelessness through the Bring America Home campaign. And this is going to be an historical um, campaign. We got about a year and a half to pass this bill. Um, but we need everyone to realize that we can address climate change and address poverty and ending homelessness because we can walk and chew gum at the same time. <laughs> All right. So without further ado, let me welcome my brother, my friend, my colleague, uh, Donald Whitehead, Executive Director, the National Coalition for the Homeless. Um, he is, in my opinion, one of the most important organizers that I've ever met. I met him when I was in Congress. And then um, Rajni Shankar Brown, Professor, Stetson University, Vice President of the NCH Board of Directors. She is the Professor and Endowed Chair of Social Justice Education at Stetson University. And she is absolutely fantastic. We are trying to make sure that we bring in the East Indian community, every ethnic community in leadership. So without further ado, this is going to be a phenomenal panel. And we're going to ask everyone to just, you know, please go three minutes each. And the uh, questions that would be asked is, you know, what are you working on? Why is it important to you? And how do we win? Without further ado, Rajni, take it away. Hi, everyone. I'm going to actually turn the mic to Donald to start us off today. And then I'll, I'll come back over. Donald? Uh, thank you, Rajni. Thank you, Joel, for that introduction and framing of the issue, uh, a critical issue uh, that has been, unfortunately, an issue that has not received the amount of attention, uh, the resources, and a real comprehensive solution that actually uh, is a solution that brings about structural change for uh, for 40 years uh, at the very least. And really, it's never been done. 40 years ago, we in the at the National Coalition uh, came up with something called the Homeless Person Survival Act. Mm -hmm. uh, that actually uh, got enacted in 1987 as the McKinney-Vento Act. Uh, it was the McKinney Act then. It got changed to Vento after his death. Uh, but that issue, that particular piece of legislation, is still the primary source of funding in the United States to address homelessness. Uh, the Homeless Person Survival Act was whittled down to an emergency response. And so for 40 years, uh, we've been treating this issue as an emergency response issue uh, and not really looking down the road, going deeper to find the structural solutions that are necessary uh, to end homelessness in America. Uh, a couple of months ago, uh, Joel and I and the National Coalition Board of Directors and partners from 70 agencies uh, decided to form a new campaign. Uh, the last real movement that we've had on homelessness uh, was the Housing Now campaign. Some of you may have been involved in that. Uh, we need to recreate that same energy. Uh, the, the ability to end homelessness is not going to come uh, from a politician's desk, or it's not going to come from a one piece of legislation. It's going to take a comprehensive strategy to end homelessness. So what I'd like to ask everybody on this call to do, and especially our panelists, is to look um, into the chat box. I've put the address for the Bring America Home Now campaign. It's the bringamericahome.org. I'm going to ask you to link on to that um, website and join our campaign. We need each and every one of you uh, to end homelessness in America. We can do it. Uh, th there's a lot of resources out there, but just last week, and I'm going to end with this, we faced uh, just uh, an insurmountable challenge in my mind. That was the end of the moratorium on evictions. Uh, at the same time, we're seeing people being swept from encampments. There is so much work we have to do. And I, I'll tell you right now and end with this, that the, the homeless service industry, uh, the industry of service providers cannot afford 25 million more homeless people. There's not enough shelter. There's not enough resources. We have to do something right now. And so with that, I'll turn it over to Rajni. 
Thank you so much, Donald. And I just, I wanna thank everyone who's been in this space today. Um, I have been uh, joining the program, the entirety of this program and how uplifting for all of us to come together united to be able to hear such diverse voices. So thank you so much, uh, Joel, Harvey, everybody who envisioned and organized this. Uh, this is the, the kind of movement that our world truly needs. So namaste. I am so grateful to be gathered today in unity with radical love, with sacred and transformative healing centered with what we are doing and to be here focused on advancing and bending the arc for justice. Thank you again, Joel Harvey, everyone who's here as we work to organize, mobilize, educate, advocate, and create a healthier, more just world for all, especially for our children and youth. We've heard from an array of amazing speakers already today. And if we are gonna create sustainable change and bend the arc toward justice, it is up to us, we the people, to come together, to work together. And our justice roundtable today reflects the power of both diversity and unity. As Maya Angelou so beautifully reminded us, in diversity there is beauty and there is strength. Centering sacred healing and shared humanity is vital to this work. We must also cultivate joy in this work and prioritize well being. I'm gonna just share a brief Sanskrit chant. Om Shanti 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 In our Sanskrit Vedas, we learn that in order to have peace, we must manifest and work towards justice. In order to have justice, we need love, deep, radical empathy and love love for each other, love for our environment, and a true collective commitment towards justice. Let us remember what Dr. King so wisely told us. Human progress is neither automatic nor inevitable. Every step towards the goal of justice requires sacrifice, suffering, and struggle the tireless exertion and passionate concern of dedicated individuals. You just heard my colleague, dear friend and co-conspirator for justice, Donald Whitehead, uh, talk about this tireless exertion and work that the National Coalition for the Homeless is engaged in. And again, we ask all of you to sign on to our campaign and for us to intersectionally work together to ensure that human rights are not only prioritized, but they are manifested into a reality that spreads its wings beautifully and widely. Currently, we have such deep fractions in our world, human suffering on massive levels, loss of precious lives, persistent and systemic racism, intersecting, intersecting with economic justice, injustice, sexism, heterosexism, ableism, xenophobia, religious and linguistic discrimination <clears throat> rooted in patriarchal colonialism, white supremacy, and okay. capitalism. And we must dismantle oppressive forces, oppressive forces that are keeping us from social and environmental justice, oppressive forces that are visible through climate change, public health disparities, the school to prison pipeline, voter suppression, immigration discrimination, continuing deep environmental and racial disparities, the too many unacceptable and distressing daunting realities that are disproportionately impacting black and brown indigenous communities, calling on all of us to rise, and to stay vigilant. When we look at the COVID-19 pandemic, we start to see so many of the fractions exasperated and magnified, especially homelessness. 
millions of individuals and families, large percentages of children and youth are disproportionately impacted every day by homelessness. Without safe shelter across the landscape of the US and the numbers we are seeing at the National Coalition for the Homeless, we are immersed in data and the numbers we are seeing continue to surge. Communities seeing up to 40% rises in numbers. And then we have the looming evictions as Donald brought up, which has the potential to move millions more displaced and into homelessness. Our world is on fire, literally and figuratively. And we cannot stop marching for social and environmental justice. We need diverse voices, women of color, centered and at tables, making decisions, having agency, being part of the leadership of movements. Congressman John Lewis told us, there's not anything more powerful than marching, the marching of feet of a determined people. We today gather with determination. So let's keep marching. Ain't gonna let nobody turn me around. Today, we renew our collective commitment as an intersectional, united, progressive coalition and we ain't gonna let nobody turn us around. Today, I am uplifted to be together in beloved community, not only as a justice scholar, educator, and activist, but especially as an amma or mother. Our children deserve a better world and we must unite for justice. Today, we have an amazing roundtable planned Donald and I are so excited to hear from all of our diverse voices. And we are so thankful, especially to our dear brother, Joel, for all of his support. We're gonna ask everyone to keep to three minutes uh, so we can hear everybody's voices today. And again, to remind us of the question that will center our discussion. What issues related to ending poverty and homelessness and addressing social and economic justice are you currently working on? And how do you think we can win? Onward and upward together. The first person I'm gonna call on today is Reverend Dr. Rodney Sadler with the National Interfaith Justice Group. He is a wonderful leader coming from Charlotte, North Carolina. Reverend Sadler, if you're with us, please join us. Thank you so very much, Rajni. It is wonderful to be with you all today. And uh, I felt so uh, welcomed with the uh, social justice, civil rights songs that you sang at the end, your message about us needing to come together, the message the need for oneness is one that's long overdue. Uh, I'm so glad today, I have to thank my friends, uh, the many friends who are here, but in particular, Joel Siegel, the visionary, I call him the Muse of Social Justice, and Andrea Miller, uh, with whom I work in so many other organizations, uh, People Demanding Action, uh, the uh, Common Cause, uh, Coalition for Common, uh, excuse me, for Center for Common Ground, uh, so many different groups uh, with all of these great folks. We are trying to work for a unified progressive community and trying to overcome so many of the difficulties that we face, difficulties that we face together because we have not decided on the right vision for America. We haven't decided on the right way of creating a nation where justice truly does roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever flowing stream. Today, I want to come here and say that I have not been able to be with some of these great conversations of late because I've been working on a, another project. It's a project that we call the Reimagining America Project. What the Reimagining America Project is, is a opportunity to bring truth and reconciliation processes to the United States, to begin to deal with some of those crises that we have dealt with for so long in terms of issues of race, racial disparity, poverty, and inequality. We think that the only way that we're going to do this is to do two things. Number one, we have to first deconstruct the concept of race. 
So often we deal with issues of racism and the way that racism undermines people's ability to thrive. We see police officers shooting black men. We put cameras on cops. We see African-American kids failing in schools and we put more money into schools, but nothing really changes. Well, nothing will really change until we get rid of that base ideology, that core root principle of race that produces injustice in our system. We can never be a nation that truly holds these truths to be self-evident that all people are created equal if we still hold on to an idea that we are fundamentally unequal, unfairly, uh, should be treated unfairly, and uh, that this is dominant. We have also begun to come together and work on this here in Charlotte. We've had six hearings so far, and we continue to suggest that the way forward as American people is, number one, we have to get rid of the racialized system that exists, have to dismantle it, and we have to reimagine what would a more just more fair system look like, and then begin to work to put that in place. This needs to be done in Charlotte. This needs to be done in uh, Los Angeles, in Cleveland, Ohio, where I find myself right now. It needs to be done across the nation. And I'm inviting you all today to come together with us to join the Reimagining America Project, and let's find a way forward so that we can truly, once and for all, have a nation that lives up to the promises of its creed. Thank you all for this time today. God bless you all. Thank you so much, Reverend Sadler, for your wise words and spirit. We're now going to have Christian Nunes, president of the National Organization for Women, located in Washington, D.C., a dear friend and colleague. Christian, welcome. Rajni, Christian uh, had to leave the call. Okay. Uh, so we're going to move on to our next. Perfect. Thank you, Donald. Domingo Garcia is our next uh, speaker for our roundtable. Okay. Domingo isn't here either. It's okay. Anna Blackburn. Awesome. Thank you for letting me know. Anna Blackburn, a Latinx leader with North Carolina Poor People's Campaign. Anna, we're so delighted to have you with us today. Buenos dias. Thank you so much. It's such a privilege to be here with you all, with all these great organizers and activists. Um, my name is Anna Ilarraza Blackburn. I am one of the tri chairs for the North Carolina Poor People's Poor People's Campaign. I'm also the first Latina immigrant liaison uh, for the North Carolina NAACP. Um, so I'm here because as an activist and organizer, I was raised with the ideology that I am my brother's keeper and watching the issues that are afflicting our communities from ecological devastation to poverty, to immigration reform. All these are interconnecting issues. Um, the Poor People's Campaign, we're organizing around the nation, you know, challenging the systems of racism, poverty, ecological devastation, war, economy, militarism, and the distorted moral narrative. Um, we are people who challenge the fa false moral narrative of religious and Christian nationalism, and who are lifting up more, a moral vision of justice and love and care for the poor, the stranger, the sick, and the least of these as a guiding moral framework for addressing public policy. Why? Because we have a moral obligation to ensure a humane and civilized society. And this nation has yet, has yet to even um, depict from its own constitution what democracy really truly looks like. So we've yet to see that vision. So we have a moral obligation to ensure that those around us um, are not being kept down and oppressed or being lifted up as a whole community. We've just finished in the Poor People's Campaign engaging in a season of direct action from July 12th to August the 8th. We engaged on various issues. Why? Because again, we cannot work on these issues individually. They are interlocking issues and we must fight them head on. If we start fighting them individually, we will never progress and create the sustainable change that we need. So why is it important um, that we support one another? Because it creates power. Because if we come together and come all of our silos, then we create the sustainable change that we need. So thank you for having us, yeah, well, having me here. And I look forward to engaging on the ground with, um, the rest of my colleagues that are here online. Thank you so much, Anna, especially speaking of that interconnection, uh, really, really important. Thank you very much. Uh, next, we have 
Ann Tobach with the Workers Circle coming from New York City. Ann, if you're well, thank here, you. you're, yes. Thank I'm here. You uh, thank you, thank you. Can you hear me? Wonderful. So thanks so much for giving the Workers Circle the opportunity to be a part of this incredible and powerful gathering. Um, I want to note you have me and my colleague Noel D'Amico on this panel, so we thought we'd combine our presentations to save some time. Um, I just wanted to share a little about the Workers Circle since I think it's new to some of you. We're a national progressive Jewish social justice organization and we have a community of over 20,000 activists across the country. We were founded in 1900 by Eastern European immigrant activists and our first members came to the United States escaping anti-Semitic violence and economic hardship. Our founders were also labor activists and they understood that it was only through collective engagement that we would win, that we would, we would create a world where dignity, safety and worker rights were respected. The Workers Circle historically was a key player in the early union movement, the fight to keep the United States a sanctuary for all immigrants, women's right to vote, civil rights, and beginning in 1957, we fought and continued to fight to end the filibuster. The Workers Circle's activism in 2021 is shaped by our founders vision for a better world. We continue their fight for democracy through today's national campaign to combat voter suppression. We understand that structural racism continues to drive terrible inequality in our society and we're a partner in the national movement to end systemic racism. We're fighting for the United States to be an open home to immigrants and refugees in need of sanctuary and for a pathway to citizenship for immigrants once they're here. And we continue to advocate on behalf of workers. As part of our social justice work, we're committed to teaching activism to young people as well as others. All, all people who want to join our community to create a, an open tent and to engage in strong coalitions that strategically organize to win. And now I'm going to turn the camera over to my colleague, our social justice director, Noel D'Amico. Noel recently, um, about a year and a half ago, joined us after over 20 years of work with the Coalition of Immokalee Workers. And she continues to teach organizing and social change at the NYU Wagner Graduate School of Public Service. And now she's gonna tell us what we need to do to win. It's so wonderful to be with all of you this afternoon. And I wanna just start by saying, we need to stop looking at what's winnable and put power behind what's essential and make it winnable. We need our movements to come together in power. And I am so delighted to have this broad array here at this table, young people, the Poor People's Campaign, people who have been working at this for so many years. So when we talk about winnable, who gets to define what is a win? It has to be those who are most directly affected. And that means that those who are directly affected must not simply be at the table, but at the head of the table, creating the solutions that the rest of us put our power behind. And we can do that because we know these models are out there and are working. For example, the Coalition of Immokalee Workers, farm workers from Southwest Florida, have taken on the largest corporations in the world to create a fair food program that's protecting the human rights of tens of thousands of workers in the fields across this nation and started a model that has been translated into industries around the world to protect workers' rights. Right here in New York City, we work together with immigrant rights organizations to pass a $2.1 billion dollar fund for excluded workers after our nation consistently left out immigrants from essential coronavirus relief. Those kinds of solutions can be scaled. So we want to start looking at how can we get our solutions from those directly impacted? How can we put our power behind it? How can we start scaling those solutions? For each of us in particular, it means coming and saying, what is my particular organization? have to bring to this coalition? What is our unique voice, our unique contribution? What resources can we bring? 
And as Reverend Graylin Hagler, Hagler mentioned at the beginning, we have to be willing to risk our access to political leaders and systems in order to marshal power. It's not only about drawing attention to the problem, it's about building a movement that's strong enough to get us to the solution. And finally, it's not only about winning, it's about sustaining the win itself. It's our ability to implement, to fund, to ensure enforcement and protection that will take us from winning something in principle to winning it in practice and changing lives on the ground as a result. I believe we can do it. The Worker Circle is glad to be a part of this coalition and thank you so much for having us be a part today. Thank you so much, Anne and Noel. Thank you very much. And Noel, I was excited to hear you speak on the Coalition uh, for Immokalee Workers as well, because I partner with them very closely in my work here in Florida. So awesome. Um, okay, next we have Natalie Fossian from The Ride Revived and Frequency Learning. Natalie, if you're here, you're welcome to Natalie, join. Natalie had to leave. Next okay. is Maureen Taylor. Okay, awesome. And I just want to pause for a moment. I, I've seen some wonderful questions coming into our chat. I haven't been able to keep up with everything, but um, I did see a few folks asking for contact information um, for various folks, including those who are on our panel right now. And so I believe Joel Siegel uh, is, is going to be putting something together, is my understanding, that will go out to everybody who's participating um, so we can all follow up, right, and continue to, to come together uh, and to, to intersectionally work on our justice issues. So um, just wanted to go ahead and share that. And um, I am just so grateful. This is awesome, good energy. And um, as we think about human rights, poverty and homelessness, uh, it, it is uh, fundamental, right, in all of our discussions and, and rooted in racism and so many of the intersectional issues we've spoken about today. I wanna now turn it over to Donald Whitehead, and um, we will come back at the end as well. Thank you, Donald. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Rajni. Thank you for your beautiful message at the beginning. I didn't know about your singing voice, but that was amazing as well. And I wanna thank all of our presenters. This has been fascinating uh, just to hear the many uh, movements that are, are coming together. And, and I hope we will coalesce and join together in the various activities, they all culminate uh, in the same thing, a need for justice in our world. So thank you all for that. Our next speaker is Maureen Taylor. Uh, she's the chairperson for the Michigan Welfare Rights Organization. Maureen? I'm here. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Fantastic. Thank you. And I'm so humbled to be invited to such an auspicious gathering. Michigan Welfare Rights has a single issue a single mission, and that is to eliminate poverty. We target different types of campaigns toward that end. And right now we are looking at ways that everyday events violate a moderate and poor people. I bring a class analysis, my sisters and brothers, to this conversation. And as just one voice of the welfare rights organization, I want to share a few observations that clarify our collective point of view. Now, most recently, you probably have heard cities in Michigan have experienced multiple heavy rains that have caused basement flooding, severe enough to prompt the governor to call for help and declare a state of emergency. The feds sent FEMA in to help us. We were delighted. Their message has been clear. Use your home insurance to cover losses if you have it. And if you don't have home insurance, you pay for the damages and FEMA will reimburse you. What did that end up in? Thousands of Michigan residents, men, women, seniors, the disabled, children, even veterans since that first June 25th and 26th a major rain event have not secured help to address this crisis. The largest energy provider in Michigan is called DTE Energy. Cities in Michigan have experienced six power outages in four months, one of which stopped refrigerators from working for days at a time 
as the 750,000 households involved in this outage, including my own, left us with spoiled food. In turn, despite the obscene profits that this one company earned during the pandemic, they have offered $25 to those households that they will pre-select to compensate for food losses. A worldwide health plague surfaces, horrific food lines develop nationwide, poor people suffer. Global weather-related warming events surface, our electricity goes out, poor people suffer. The Titanic starts to sink. The families referred to as steerage on the lower levels find out that they need to run up top. There's no room for them in the lifeboats as they fight their way up to the upper decks so poor people suffer. I will end my remarks by quoting so often the masters, the classics. In this case, I'm going to cl uh, close by quoting uh, uh, Science Officer Spock and James T. Kirk having a conversation and James Kirk is upset because Spock is about to die. But before Spock leaves the earth, what he says is the following. Jim, never forget that the needs of the many must always outweigh the needs of the few or the one. Thank you. My name is Maureen Taylor. I'm honored to serve as state chairperson of the Michigan Welfare Rights Organization. And thank you so very much for your patience. I'll go back on mute. Maureen, uh, we thank you so much for bringing us that message. Uh, so many problems with uh, just utter failure of public, uh, public institutions and private industry in the Michigan area. Uh, we stand in solidarity with you as yet another one uh, has been identified. Uh, and uh, thank you so much for your comments. Our next speaker is Mia Sinicole uh, from March for Our Lives. Hi. Hi, everyone. Hi. Um, for those who may have missed my earlier section in today's programming, my name is Mia. I'm the Deputy Organizing Director at March for Our Lives. For those who aren't familiar, March for Our Lives is a gun violence prevention organization that was born out of the tragic shooting at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School um, in Parkland, Florida in 2018, in which 17 lives were lost. Out of that tragedy, a youth-led movement with 300 chapters across the country was born. Now, the National Gun Violence Prevention Movement has not traditionally focused its efforts on understanding why gun violence happens in the first place, March for Our Lives be included in that. Um, when people don't feel safe and they don't feel cared for by the state, they are more likely to turn to guns and gun violence as a means for protection and safety. This doesn't excuse it, but it does mean that we know how to end it and that traditional gun violence prevention tactics such as assault weapons bans and universal background checks alone aren't enough. To fully eradicate gun violence, we must understand and liberate ourselves from its root causes, including poverty. The communities facing the highest rates of everyday gun violence have been intentionally impoverished, systemically denied resources and opportunities by the state for generations. The COVID-19 pandemic has especially highlighted wealth disparities, and we've also seen gun sales reach unprecedented numbers during the pandemic. This unprecedented spike in gun sales in combination with increased economic hardship are accelerating our gun violence crisis. We know that poverty relief efforts, including employment programming opportunities, are proven to reduce gun violence. There's legislation we can advocate for, such as the Opening Doors for Youth Act of 2021, which provides subsidized summer and year-round employment for youth who face systemic barriers to employment and viable career options, and to assist local community partnerships in improving high school graduation, graduation and youth employment rates. We can also further alleviate poverty by showing solidarity and working towards raising workers' wages, um, advocating for affordable housing, and doing mutual aid work. Recently at March for Our Lives, um, we rolled out a mutual aid program called Aid and Alliance in which our youth organizers on the ground are working directly with communities directly with grassroots organizations who are focused solely on poverty relief. Our organizers are hosting 
food supply and school supply drives, contributing to rent relief programs, and are working directly um, with other local organizations who combat poverty every day. Our investments and advocacy efforts, not only for gun violence prevention, but in all issue areas really have to center community, including programming, mutual aid, and preventative and destigmatizing work that does reflect cultural competence. Um, I also just wanna say Ace, before um, my section wraps up, um, again, thank you so much um, to Joel and everybody else who's helped um, organize this National Justice Roundtable. It's been great to hear just from the diversity of speakers and experts from all issues um, of advocacy. So thank you again. Thank you, Mia. Uh, really a uh, very, very, very important issue and one uh, we see raising its head every day. And just thank you for the courage of your group uh, to really uh, elevate this issue in a way that I think conversations are happening uh, that we wouldn't have seen uh, several years ago. So thank you for the, the courage, the passion, and the stick to itness that that has really started to raise this issue. I hope we can get further down the line, but thank you for your efforts. We really, really appreciate having you here. Um, and I echo the thanks to Joe for bringing such a powerful, diverse panel uh, that's really looking at the the plethora of issues that we have in this country that we need to coalesce on. And I say that again, we need to come together and show that there's a force for justice that, that is a combined force that can't be defeated. Um, our next speaker is Norman Stockwell, and he's the publisher of Progressive Magazine. Thank you very much. I'm very pleased to uh, be invited here today. And of course, um, all of these issues that we've been talking about for the last few hours are things that we cover in the pages of our magazine. The Progressive is a uh, 112 year old national political magazine based in Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, in our tradition, we are uh, fiercely uh, anti-militarist uh, against corporate influence in our democracy, uh, pro-free speech, pro-human rights, pro-workers' rights, uh, supportive of a sustainable environment and uh, grassroots democracy. In addition to a bi-monthly magazine and a website, progressive.org, we also have two projects. One is called Public Schools Advocate, which reports, we support journalists around the country reporting on the uh, attempt to privatize public schools across the United States and the fight back against that attempt. And the other project is called Progressive Perspectives. And the, pro the goal of that project is to uh, diversify the op-ed pages of our nation's newspapers. And we distribute op-eds through the Tribune News Service to newspapers across the United States. In fact, uh, Donald, we did one of yours in, uh, in June of this year on homelessness. Um, our magazine was started by uh, Robert M. LaFollette. He was a progressive senator and governor of Wisconsin. He founded the magazine in 1909. And uh, in 1924, he created a progressive political party and ran for president of the United States. And at that time in his speech, he said, America is not made, but is in the making. Mere passive citizenship is not enough. Men must be aggressive for what is right if government is to be saved from those who are aggressive for what is wrong. Uh, very much a, uh, a tradition of political activism as, uh, as we are gathered here today and a tradition of unifying people to work on these issues. Um, in 1918, uh, Bob LaFollette also said, the supreme issue involving all others is the encroachment of the powerful few on the rights of the many. And about a hundred years after that in 2019, back when we could still uh, gather in person at events, I spoke at Fighting Bob LaFollette's birthplace in uh, Wisconsin. And I just wanted to read a couple of words from that. Uh, Today, we are again faced with a great political crisis with economic inequality rivaling the days of the robber barons redistricting and voter ID laws impeding the ability of citizens to vote and corporate influence skewing our electoral system with volumes of cash unimaginable in La Follette's time. Once again, people are calling for a return to a truly democratic system of governance by and for the people. 
in these struggles that we chronicle in our magazine today, these voices that we lift up, voices that are otherwise unrepresented in the media. As Fighting Bob said, when he was elected overwhelmingly to the US Senate for a second term in 1911, tyranny and oppression are just as possible under democratic forms as under any other. We are slow to realize that democracy mm -hmm. is a life that involves continual struggle. It is only as those of every generation who love democracy resist with all their might the encroachments of its enemies that the ideals of representative government can ever be nearly approximated. So that's our message for today. And it's so wonderful to join together with all of you and uh, look forward to continuing this work to building a progressive unified movement here in the United States. Norman, uh, really, really well said, and I thank you for uh, just your uh, long history of providing uh, the information, the education uh, that the progressive movement needs to keep going. Please uh, continue your fine work and, and really appreciate uh, the opportunity to have an op-ed um, in, in your publication, and thank you for that, and, and thank you for all you do. Uh, your, your words are beautiful and uh, they reflect the, the beauty of, of your publication. So thank you very much. Uh, our next uh, speaker is Phyllis Zalatoro. Uh, she's a universal health care senior citizens right and disability act. Donald, your, your next speaker that's here is Donna Marie Woodson. Thank you, Andrea. Uh, and Andrea, thank you for all your powerful work too as well. I, I don't think you get enough of the recognition for the amazing work that you do. Um, so uh, with that, we'll go to Donna Marie Woodson, the Alliance of Moral Progressives. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I am so honored to be here at this historic round table. I too believe that we need to come together to have this united progressive um, coalition because it's, it's critical that and that I want to be a part of that I plan to be a part of that. Uh, yes, my name is Donna Marie Woodson and I'm communications director with the Alliance of Moral Progressives AMP, as we call ourselves, and also a lifelong activist. And as a progressive activist on the grassroots level, I, my mission is to end homelessness and poverty and achieve social and economic um, equity with education, through education and year-round civic involvement of underserved communities. I think that that education is the pathway to getting progressive candidates elected so that they can forward our progressive policies that benefit everyone um, I know that one of the things that I, I find working with people on the ground and talking to my neighbors is that people don't have any idea the implications of voting and what that means for them at their own home. So that's why they tune out because they don't see any benefit for them. But if we work with them one-on-one, -on -one, we can represent um, the word of this is why we vote. This is why we engage in that citizenship because it affects you, my neighbor, where you live, whether you know it or not. And uh, every time I talk to someone and they bring up the word politics, I tell them here, do this, write the word politics on a piece of paper and then set the paper on fire. Because that word has been a ploy forever to get people not to vote. Oh, it's just about politics. That doesn't have anything to do with me. We have to break it down on a one-on-one -on -one level to be the human face of our shared uh, common issues. And that's so important. The other thing about education that I've watched over the years is voters don't understand that there's not uh, voting just every four years, there is a vote going on every year. And they need to be aware of that. And they need to participate in their local elections. I think that's where we lose so much ground when people are not participating and understanding who their county representatives are, city council, sheriff, and not least, but the governor. And that's why we have all of these uh, voter suppression bills being passed because 
of people not participating on the local level and making sure that they put in place people who are going to have their best interests at heart. So that's why when I talk to my fellow community, um, I'm a precinct chair organizer. So I talk to people all the time and I tell them, you know what, the, the rep, our representatives report to us. It should not be the other way around. We have got to be involved in city council meetings, standing up and, and voicing what we want, our issues. And you know what, having our own meetings and telling our representatives, you need to be at that meeting because we want to hold you accountable. You come and talk to us because you work for us. I really want people to take that power back. They don't see it. But I tell them all the time, you have the power. Let's use it collectively. That's what this is all about. We can just exponentially improve everybody's lives and have so much more power on the state and the federal level. Uh, I always say, you know, pressure on our politicians, create wins from the grassroots up. So thank you very much. I'm very honored to be here today and Absolutely. United Progressive Coalitions. Let's stick together. Thank you. Thank you, Donna. Uh, really important messages. Uh, we know education is the antidote to poverty. And thank you for bringing that up. And I'll, I'll say if you don't like uh, the people that are running your community, your state or your country, run for office yourself. Um, uh, and uh, we'll go to our next speakers, uh, our next speaker. Uh, we have a couple of really amazing speakers and thank you all who've had the opportunity to speak so far, just some amazing thoughts. Uh, and uh, we really appreciate all of your, um, all of your um, opportunities to share your wisdom as a part of this forum. Uh, our next uh, speaker is Joe Libertelli. Um, and I hope I pronounced that right, Joe, from the University of District of Columbia, right? Yes, that's right. Okay, thank you. So I, I don't comfortably fit into this topic. Joel and I had a discussion um, about how we can um, get folks out of silos. And so while I have worked on social justice and environmental activism my entire career, uh, I will mention that I helped save the Antioch School of Law and, cre and, and help create the now UBC David A. Clark School of Law, which is a social justice clinical law school, interracial social justice law school in the nation's capital, help start progressive Democrats. Um, I am working on a common calendar that would list the activities of all of our organizations and make it really, really easy for people who wanted to do more in their local area to be able to find uh, the exact thing that, that got them excited and that would maximize their potential as a volunteer. Uh, but I think the idea that, that I mentioned to Joel that he was most interested in is that um, in order to, to, to get folks uh, who are doing such important work, trying to save human beings and trying to protect uh, the environment, uh, whether it's a specific piece or the climate uh, in, uh, you know, in general, what could motivate us to, to work together? Um, well, one possibility is if we had a clear decision-making process uh, through which we could come together and discuss all of our options and really think it through, get to know one another, get to know each other's issues, um, and, and make intelligent decisions about strategic uh, projects that we could work on. Uh, I use the term Congress. Of course, Joel, his ears lit, lit up when I mentioned that, having spent so many years working in Congress, but a progressive Congress uh, reminiscent of the African National Congress, um, but a formalized structure where we would, we would take the time to think through uh, who would be represented in it, what the process for, for thinking through the ideas might be. Um, and then um, another aspect of it is if there was an impressive uh, array of organizations uh, that came together to, in such a process, I suspect that we could find wealthy individuals who would uh, put up money to fund prospectively uh, the, the collective decision about the specific project that we work on, maybe projects. And uh, in addition, having money, if there was a million dollars or $5 million, that would encourage organizations to get more involved. And as an individual who is not a millionaire, um, I would be willing to put up you know, $1,000 uh, on a contingent basis if we got enough other people to make this a go, I would, I would kick in. And so you could create 
a, a virtuous cycle um, to, uh, to get us working together so that we can pick strategically on, on what issue, whether it's a voting, passing a voting rights law, whether it's uh, voting rights for the District of Columbia, ending felon disenfranchisement, strategically, what could we do that would benefit all of us? I, I would say that's, that's what we should think about. And uh, with regard to DC voting rights, since I have been a longtime DC resident, though not, not uh, currently, um, one possibility could be uh, to float the notion of uh, if 5,000 other people were to commit to doing nonviolent uh, civil disobedience for DC voting rights in a time, place, and manner as determined by uh, Reverend Hagler and Joel and other known people, and we were to milk it for all the publicity, perhaps that the drama of doing that would be enough to move our fellow Americans across the country uh, to think more kindly on DC, on DC voting rights. And so I would look forward to uh, being part of a discussion about how we can actually address power. I mean, we have wonderful ideas. Um, I'm confident that we have the solutions to how the country and the world could be more sustainably and, and, uh, and, and equitably run but we just don't have the power. So getting out of the silos, coming up with mechanisms to do that is what I'm most interested in. And I really appreciate the opportunity uh, to be here and to share these thoughts. And thank you to the organizers. Joe, we thank you as well. Thank you for those comments. Really, really uh, important issue you just, uh, you just raised. Uh, DC statehood is something that's long overdue. Uh, and thank you for your advocacy on it and, and helping to start the birth. Uh, uh, PDA and the progressive movement. Um, I understand that Phyllis Zola Toro uh, has uh, now uh, been able to join us. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. So Phyllis, um, and uh, who is a universal health advocate, uh, she advocates for also um, senior citizens and disability rights. Uh, thank you for joining us. Um, I don't see Phyllis yet. Why don't we do this? Why don't we go to James Fukuda, who is one of the leaders of LULAC. Uh, one of the, uh, I'm sorry. Okay, so let's go back again. Is that Phyllis? Yes, that's me. <laughs> okay, Phyllis, why don't you go ahead and James, please wait on deck. We'll have you up next. Good evening, everyone. I am with the newly formed Secure Seniors Group because we're fed up and we're scared. I've been advocating for low income senior renters for years. We are a group that is continually being ignored, possibly because many seniors are computer illiterate or feel vulnerable. The one thing you will never see is senior women and men marching in DC with canes, walkers, and wheelchairs, that ship has sailed. The largest group ever born in the United States, the baby boomers, will all be 65 and over in eight years. And not all of us have been able to save for retirement. Two thirds of seniors 65 and over are women. Despite social security, women over 65 are in danger of falling into critical poverty. So this is a serious and urgent women's issue. The federal statistics are if rent is more than 30% of your income, you are rent burdened. At 50% of income, you are severely rent burdened. On a personal note, when my, so, when my unemployment benefits end in two weeks, my rent will be 70% of my income. So I don't know what category I fall into. But I'm only one of millions of low income seniors in this situation. Very few new low income developments are planned because developers can't even break even on these builds. The only possible resolution seems to be low income senior rental assistance so that grandmas and grandpas don't end up living under bridges. 
It's a frightening situation to be in. I have neighbors who have told me at the end of the month, if they have $20 left, that's a big deal. And we do have the right to have a little fun besides staring at the four walls. And when we get bored, leaning back and staring at the ceiling for a change of scenery. The government absolutely needs to fund rental assistance and HUD should be responsible for that. Thank you very much. Phyllis, thank you very much. Thank you for bringing that um, issue to our attention. Uh, we are working very hard. I encourage you to join the Bring America Home Now campaign. One of the biggest components of our campaign right. is uh, increasing housing production in this country. And that would be protecting public housing and making the Section 8 program an entitlement. So I urge you to join our campaign. Uh, Absolutely. Thank you for being here. I'm going to bring on our next speaker, who is James Fakuda, and James is one of the leaders of LULAC, which is the largest Latin American advocacy organization. Uh, he's a champion for ending homelessness and also a progressive business leader and also one of the core team members of the Bring America Home Now Act uh, and also a National Coalition board member. So James Fakuda, with the many titles, uh, you are our next speaker. Well, thank you, Donald, Joel. Uh, I'd like to thank the, the two ladies before me, Ms. Woodson and uh, Phyllis. It seems to me that we live in a time where the majority of us have become disposable. Our society, our government, sucks people dry, gets whatever value they care to admit to out of, out of us, out of all of us, and then throws us away. This was particularly true during COVID when I took over several of the hotels in New York City that uh, were housing homeless people who had COVID and discovered that the people who had managed the building before me had allowed two people to die alone and unnoticed. And when we unlocked the room, uh, it was very clear that those people had been dead for several days. We're disposable. If you don't want to be disposable, then you have to reconcile yourself to the fact that we are in a war. We're in a war with a very few people and their psychophants and everyone else. Because now, because of funding, because of local politics that creates zoning and land use problems, um, we're segregated. If you live in the wrong community, you're segregated in housing, in education, in the ability to get uh, nutritional food, childcare, uh, an easy way to get to work. This has to stop. It isn't just the federal government. It's also local government. We have to ask questions. Who controls? the decisions made on sewage systems, on water supply systems, in housing, which is what I know, who controls the bond finance for low-income housing, who controls the disbursement of tax credits? I ask all of you, join me, join us, fight for yourselves, Let's fight for each other. They have taken away, the government has taken away our self-respect. All I can say is whether you choose to fight or not, I respect you and I hope you respect me. Self-respect is where this is all going to start and how we're going to finish it. Thank you. James, thank you so much. Uh, really important, uh, really important things for us to consider. 
Um, and uh, you said something so powerful that we're all um, expendable. That's really uh, the message that we need to, to send here. And the only way we're not expendable is if we come together. Uh, power concedes nothing without protest. It never has and it never will. Um, so thank you for reminding us of that. Uh, we, we have two more speakers and then we'll get to lasagna Hauer. Our next speaker is a progressive labor hero from the United Auto Workers Union and a close contact of the former uh, Congressman John Conyers. Uh, and our, our next speaker is Bob Sisler. Bob, thank you for being here. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to say that I'm, I'm with the retired workers out of Region 1A. That's a little bit a uh, smaller area than the whole country. But uh, also, we're, we've uh, worked with retirees for single payer. And I guess what I'd like to say today is I've had these speakers before me and I've changed what I was going to say three or four times. But I like the idea, and I know the idea, that we are very, very disposable. And what I'd like to talk about is how did we get this way? John Conyers often said, everything connected. When we started working on health care, of course, we saw the injustice in that. But then we started seeing injustices, whether we talk about water's given out to people, how they can turn off water when we have so much water in Detroit area. And we, we just see all this injustice. How do we get this way? Well, what I have seen, and I guess it comes from uh, something I just saw this week, is when we talk about equality, we also have to talk about equity in the society. And we do not have equity in the society. As Marion said, those people who could afford insurance, no problem, and sometimes got relief from FEMA even with the insurance. But people who are redlined in Detroit, it's screw you again and screw you again. You're so poor, you can't afford the insurance, so you're so poor, you can't get any help. That is what's going on. And why does it go on? Because we, as Americans, have accepted that we are all in a different class. We do not believe in true common good in mind when we make a call. It's how do I support those people who will help me get reelected? And that is our problem because we are living in these silos. We're allowed to think I'm better than you because I have something a little bit better than you. Instead of recognizing that there is a pattern, there's always been a pattern, but the 1% and these corporations have allowed us to put ourselves in silos. We're fighting against. We're fighting against everything that FDR tried to put in his eight bill of education, uh, security of a house uh, for your family, uh, the idea of having health care for everyone, social security for the older. And when he talks about these eight bill of rights, he says, you have to have something for you and your family, but you also have to have recreation. If you don't have recreation, is this a bill of rights about um, making a better life? No. He, when he gave his speech, he said, this is to avoid fascism. And we almost saw that happen last year in Washington. So we realize that countries, where they, they have embraced these Bill of Rights, spend more time on education and less on putting more kids in. Spend more time on making sure everybody has health care and spend less time on having a system, a judicial system, that follow our ways, our educational system. These are the inequities that we have throughout our society until we realize that we got to bring this all together and promote equality and equity in every school in this country. We have to promote health care that is not by uh, definition giving 
the wealthiest guy uh, who operates at millions of dollars and sometimes billions, and the guy who's scrubbing the floor and getting rid of the corona, not even enough to look. It's a shame what this country has become. Because when we look at the countries, even Canada, did, did they go around and ask for $1,400 over, over uh, this corona thing? No, the prime minister came in and said, everyone's going to get 2000 a month for three months because that's what we're asking you to stay home. So to run a house, you at least need 2000 See the difference? Where is where we, the people have taken control of the government and make it work for them? We have let these corporations with us. Is that because of slavery? Is that because begging idea that government has to give us something? I can only tell you the reality. That's what we do. We beg them instead of demanding that they do equal justice for all. Thank you. And may God's peace rest with you for the rest of the day. Bob, thank you very much. Uh, extremely powerful. Thank you uh, for reminding us uh, who the power really lies with. And uh, with that, we're going to go to our final speaker, uh, and then you'll get to move into your spaghetti hour. Um, but our final speaker um, is, is a, a wonderful speaker. Dr. Bill Honickman is a retired emergency room doctor and a leading advocate for Medicare for All and improved healthcare for all. So, uh, Dr. Bill, uh, we look forward to hearing from you. Well, uh, thank you so much. Can you hear me okay? We can hear you. Great, thanks. So, uh, yeah, I want to um, uh, thank uh, everybody for being here today, especially the faithful few that stuck around for the end, and uh, but the organizers, and I'm truly humbled to be um, with all the other terrific panelists and, um, and participants uh, who are doing so much great work across the country. Uh, and um, I, I'm Bill Honigman. I'm, I am a retired emergency room physician. I organize the healthcare issue team for uh, Progressive Democrats America. Um, and so much great stuff has been said already. I'm just going to share a couple of uh, things with you all uh, to kind of conclude this segment, I guess. Um, I did want to share two kind of graphic illustrations. One is in the virtual background behind me, and it's uh, apropos that you mentioned spaghetti because this spaghetti diagram, which is a bunch of lines and little boxes, is actually how we pay for healthcare in America. And um, the, uh, the healthcare expert who drew this diagram for me says there's actually four or five layers of this nonsense. Um, and, uh, and this is, I would uh, offer to you, is not just um, administrative waste, uh, and BS, but it's also the opportunity for fraud and abuse. This is where they hide all the backroom deals, the surprise billing that people get, and the abuse of the extortion model business practices of big pharma and big insurance and big hospital that prices the product of healthcare in America based on what your life is worth to you, saying, hey, that's a nice kid you got there, be ashamed if something happened to them and you know, buy our overpriced healthcare product to save their lives instead of what it actually costs them to provide that service. The other thing I want to offer to you in terms of this argument for uh, uh, economic justice is the data that I threw into the chat, and that is that the United States is the unmitigated, the all-time gold medalist in COVID deaths. And why is that? It's because of this mess. But as we all know, we have over 600,000 people who have died of COVID in this country. And that is the world leader, despite the fact that we do not have the largest population of any country in the world. We're still the world leader in COVID deaths. A full 40%, as you can see in the second number there, some 254,000 people, those lives could have been saved if we had a single payer Medicare for all system. And that was derived by the Distinguished Lancet Commission, a panel of uh, health, um, public health uh, experts uh, that was published just this last February. And those 
uh, COVID deaths, those av avoidable, preventable COVID deaths are continuing now as we speak. So let me just uh, pose to you what we're doing through Prevent the Democrats America. Most people here know that we're a peace and social justice um, organization that does our work both inside and outside the Democratic Party. We are primarily issues-based and always mindful of the intersectionality, especially as regards issues of uh, existential threat, meaning climate, health, poverty, racism, war, and political corruption. As you can see, COVID-19 is a clear clarion call for this global co uh, consciousness. Um, Medicare for All addresses the needs for healthcare justice in that we're talking about universal healthcare where all of the people get all of the care and nothing less will be satisfactory. Uh, and it's science-based, meaning all public health and economic science says that it saves money and saves lives. And we will continue to, um, to uh, uh, rest on that foundational knowledge. What we are doing right now is advocating for expanding and improving Medicare because it advances that goal. In particular, it puts the most egregious predatory commercial interests in the medical industrial complex on notice. Namely, big pharma, big insurance, and big hospital are all threatened by what's being moved right now through Congress in the budget and reconciliation processes and even through Joe Biden's Build Back Better Act. So it's heartening to see um, Joe Biden and even a lot of the status quo Democrats now using our language that healthcare is a human right. And the president himself just the other day said it was no longer acceptable that prices be based on what the market will allow rather than what is um, determined by the public need. That's a tribute to the work that we're doing in the social justice community and the movement of healthcare justice and Medicare for all. So you can see that we are winning already. We are advancing the cause and it's just a matter of when, not a what, uh, that we get there. And thank you all for doing the great work that you do. And please follow us at uh, PDA, uh, pdamerica.org. We're still conducting weekly town hall meetings during the period of time of our healthcare crisis known as the COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you once again. Thank you so much, Dr. Bill. And I wanna thank all of our just amazing speakers for raising so many uh, really, really important issue, issues and uh, I want to close with just a couple of uh, uh, thoughts uh, and then turn it over to Rajni for the last statement. So, so the one thing that I, I want us to uh, remember is that we have incredible challenges in front of us. Uh, but um, we know that all of us have people in our ancestry who have overcome even more unsurmountable challenges or insurmountable challenges. Uh, if you're an African-American, somebody in your family survived the Middle Passage, uh, chattel slavery, Jim Crow, and also um, modern day racism. If you're an Asian-American, you have survived recent Asian hate. Uh, you also survived internment uh, in this country. If you're a Native American, you survived the, the, the trail of tears. If you're a Jewish American, somebody in your family survived the Holocaust, and I could go on and on. Uh, the challenge of our time is, is, is tough, but it's not insurmountable, and no challenge has been insurmountable to people who start to get dissatisfied with current conditions. And I'll leave you with my, my favorite quote about being dissatisfied because we've seen the ugly head of inequality raise its head during this pandemic. Uh, we've seen it for many years, but none so, uh, so, so visual as what we've seen through COVID. So we have to not be satisfied with these conditions, whether it's the lack of housing, uh, the climate change, a catastrophe that's happening with fires in California and floods in Louisiana. 
we cannot be satisfied. Mm -hmm. And I could not say it better than the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. And this is what he said in one of his final speeches, where do we go from here? Dr. King said, let us be dissatisfied until America would no longer have a high blood pressure of creeds and an anemia of deeds. Let us be dissatisfied until the tragic walls that separate the outer city of wealth and comfort and the inner city of poverty and despair shall be crushed by the battering rams of the forces of justice. Let us be dissatisfied until those that live on the outskirts of hope are brought into the metropolis of daily security. Let us be dissatisfied until the slums are cast into the junk heaps of history and every family is living in a decent home. Dr. Martin Luther King, uh, let us be dissatisfied. We can't be satisfied with any of this. And with that, I'll pass it on to Dr. Rajni Shankar Brown. Thank you so much. That was beautiful, Donald, uh, hearing you recite Dr. King's words, uh, my heart. Uh, just paused for a moment there. Uh, thank you all again, everyone who has been here today uh, for this round table, who has shown up with commitment and care. Our world needs all of us, and it's going to take all of us collectively working to advance justice. Let us persist and let us also stay hopeful in spite of all of the challenges, the heartache, the suffering, there is still hope. We feel that hope emerging and radiating today as we all come together. Everyone deserves shelter, food, quality health care, educational access and opportunity. Everyone deserves to be treated with dignity and we must fiercely love one another. Let us remember as Congressman John Lewis put it, never ever be afraid to make some noise and to get into good trouble, necessary trouble. We are the people and we got this. Let us continue to get into good trouble and support one another. Namaste. Namaste. Fantastic. Um, wow, Rajni, <laughs> wonderful. Donna, wonderful. James, wonderful. The whole panel was incredible. Um, give yourselves a round of applause. I will say that we are the richest country in the world. You can't be the richest country in the world and then the poorest country of the world at the same time. Our, our, we're worth $66 trillion. We just need to get organized, get out of our silos, and we shall overcome. Thank you very much. Let me throw it back to Harvey Washington. Well, this has been an astounding, astounding <laughs> yeah. series of panels. We still have more than 100 people with us. I want to say that in the course of this panel, this discussion, this National Justice Roundtable, the last military, American military aircraft left Afghanistan. Let us hope that we never, ever again get into another useless, worthless, bloody war like Afghanistan. Since World War II, we were in Korea, we were in Vietnam. Central America, Iraq, Afghanistan, we all know how well that went. So one of the major things that we have to accomplish as progressives in this country is to never allow any of these military lunatic excursions again, never again. So uh, that it's, it's fitting that this uh, event, I, I remember very well April 30th, 1970, uh, 75. And uh, today we can remember this event as well. Uh, no more imperial wars. I've always liked to say that the baby boomers, well, I haven't liked to say it, but it's reality. The baby boomers set out to do two things. We set out to revolutionize the country, the, the culture, and we set out to end the empire. And so far we're one for two but maybe today we'll mark the end of the empire. And only when we end the empire, are we gonna be able to accomplish our social, political, ecological, um, economic goals for justice, for peace and for prosperity. So I am blown away by the quality of the presentations This far exceeded our wildest dreams. I mean, we had not a single 
speaker that was in any way, shape, or form uh, less than stellar. And uh, it's been an amazing, amazing accomplishment. What we have done here, we hope, is to unite, get people out of our silos, both our grain silos and our miss missile silos, and unified in DC statehood, in election protection and voter engagement, in saving our planet Earth, at least making it possible that we can live here. Our planet Earth will save herself. The question is whether humankind is gonna be allowed to continue here. And finally to, not finally, but to deal with social justice, <coughs> homelessness uh, and, and uh, poverty. It's been an astounding afternoon. This tape, uh, this video will be available at election protection 2024 dot org and elsewhere uh, the first hour will be podcast on the progressive radio network five to six p.m this coming thursday but it will be forever available and on this coming monday a week from today at 5 p.m we will have another of our grassroots emergency election protection coalition meetings we want please everyone send us your contacts so that we this we are going to be going on this at least through November 2024. This is both a moment and a movement. And, um, you know, this is just the first moment in this escalated movement. This has been Joel Siegel's brainchild to cut us all unified and together. And we, I mean, it is just an incredibly diverse and powerful uh, experience to sit through. Harvey and Joel, we had. Did you want to hear from a couple of young people at the end too? Absolutely, yes. Okay. And then we will our our, <laughs> our lasagna and spaghetti hour, <laughs> our pasta hour will continue, and we will uh, allow as long as Steve Caruso can stay as awake and with us to engineer. We'll have as many people uh, uh, raise their hand this, and speak as possible. So okay, go ahead, this, to this fitting, Thank you, uh, Nat Fashon. Natalie, are you still with us? Uh, she may have had to go. Or K Kaylin Taylor. Tatanka, Tatanka, can you give us some, some closing yeah, remarks? Yeah, closing sure. thoughts, please, Tatanka. <laughs> sure. Uh, well, I, I just want to echo what, what Harvey said. Um, this has been an amazing experience. I want to thank you, everyone, all the all the, the moderators, all the speakers, especially all the participants, I wanna encourage every moderator to get back to all your speakers and listen, you know? I wanna encourage all the speakers to get back to the people you invited and ask them how it went for them, you know, what they loved about it, is there any improvement? We wanna hear your feedback. So please email us and call everybody on leadership. It's clear to me that there is a need for this. It's clear to me, I learned early in my political career that the winning candidate or winning issue is the one that creates the context in which we win, that creates the conversation in which we win. This is one such context. So I, I do believe we've, we, we have an experiment going that can be a small idea whose time has come to unite our progressive community which can translate into legislation in DC. And I just wanna, I'm just filled with gratitude and I wanna thank the fact, I wanna thank our creator. I wanna thank our ancestors because we don't do this alone. We know there's no separation in all the universe. And that means not just between me humans, but the plant people, the rock people, the animal people, if we humans can learn to take care of our air and our water and our fire and our soils, we will be taken care of. So that's what, when we say omatakuyas in all our <laughs> relations, and when we say all the four worlds of grandmother earth, we mean how can we humans live in harmony with mother nature? So to that extent, just a, a final reminder that those of us in California are working on a California Green New Deal that aims to put our state in alignment with that. We're working on a plan that's not just a 30 year plan, a la Joe Biden. It's been a 10 year plan, but now we're trying to see if it can be a five year plan. And we intend to pass that in 2022. 
and have that be what we all run for for the 2024 elections. That's our dream. Thank you, everyone, for being together. Taka, Thank Natalie, you for the leadership. We got, we've got Natalie. Oh, Natalie, great. Come on board, Nat. Hi, I just wanted to say um, thank you everyone. It was really informative today from a young person's perspective. What I heard today a lot was about education, educating ourselves on these issues so we can better educate our community on these issues. And once we're able to do that, we can move forward in an informed manner. Um, so I think that is the golden rule that, that I learned today from everyone speaking. Um, like I said, we need to educate so we can mediate like we're doing today and we can co-create a better future for all of us and our young people as well, moving forward. Thank you, Natalie. Do you have those first three things that what we're gonna I do, do. on next steps? Why don't you read them I off? I do. Um, on second Monday of the month, 5 p.m. Eastern time, uh, the National NJR Solidarity Check-In and Deeper Dive Zoom. Um, announce date and time of the monthly NJR national, yeah, that call. Um, we will have a regularly scheduled NJR podcast and um, a monthly newsletter so we can all know who's doing what. Great and idea. a press, press release going out tomorrow announcing the historic formation of this National Justice Roundtable. We'll be working on a National Justice Roundtable website and there's gonna be series, as Harvey has said, of round tables each month as we go forward. And we are creating a smart Alex so we can generate our own progressive, our own progressive legislation headed up by Joel Siegel. And we're gonna need ongoing feedback as we grow this because we're growing a community. And so I learned from Dolores in the late 60s and early 70s. I learned community organizing from her. We would always build up with two or three people in a room, build it up to a mass that could go to the city council or could go to the state, but we would always break down back at the level of the smallest family and community. And her foundation now has 18 vecinos unidos throughout United Neighbors throughout the Valley. So we need to keep in touch, listen to our people, grow this forward with what we learn, and uh, with that, I believe we can be an unstoppable force, an idea whose time has come. Aho. 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 Okay. Anybody uh, that we missed that was on the regular list? Joel, I know you had a list of folks you wanted to jump in. Steve Caruso, I hope you can drink some coffee and stay with us for a while. We've got a lot of hands raised. I have put on my grandfather's shirt in honor of the young people. Uh, my wife doesn't like to tell me how many, tell people how many grandchildren we have, but we are, I will say in double figures. <laughs> so anyway, this is for them. Uh, Joel, did you, uh, uh, Steve, I hope you can stay with us brother. And um, uh, Joel, you have some folks to announce. We are gonna, we've got hands up from Herschel, Ruth, George, uh, Taylor, Rob, Jeffrey, uh, Barry, so we'll we'll go as far as we possibly can and still, until Sluggo. Steve kills over. Yes, Mike. This is uh, Mike Hirsch. I was supposed to be on the speakers list, but I gave up my spot because I wanted to hear from everybody else. Oh, and you're I'm welcome. Really, yeah. yeah, and I'm really thrilled that all of our speakers understood that the, the movement is the thing. The movement's more important than any single person. And as uh, um, every one of our speakers exemplified. We are building a team. There's no I in team. We're going to win together as a united force. And uh, I just wanted to thank you, Sluggo, for keeping the show going. Uh, I knew we were in good hands when we picked you to be our master of ceremonies. You yeah. outdid yourself. Joel Siegel, extraordinary work. I've been working with you for many, many years. And this is among the, the greatest hits of Joel Siegel, which is saying a lot. <laughs> Thank you so much. Andrew Thank you. Miller had to, to move on to another uh, Zoom meeting. I think she lives on Zoom these days. But Andrea Miller, as those who work with her know, is a giant, just an absolute uh, uh, genius in, in organizing online, offline, getting people to the polls, the unsung hero of, of many electoral miracles. Thank you, Andrew Miller, and her wonderful team. 
when Andrew Miller is uh, part of a project, she brings uh, a, a, a group of terrific individuals who you will not hear a peep from them, but they will make sure that everything works perfectly. And if people understood how difficult it was, we, you know, uh, Sluggo and Joel, you and, and all of our moderators made it look easy. It was not easy. And thank you to, to everybody who's been um, with us for, for this uh, historic event. I wanna thank you from the bottom of my heart. I'm inspired, I'm fired up, I'm ready for some lasagna. So are, are we ready to stop the recording and dig into our pasta celebration? Thank you, yes, thank I'll you, Mike, you've been so great. I do wanna say, I did not realize before I looked in the camera when this started that I am a walking advertisement for global warming here. So uh, we-, we <laughs> And against <laughs> nuclear energy. <laughs> yes, and against nuclear weapons or whatever. Uh, Joel, uh, it's all you, brother. Well, first of all, I'm also blown away by all the great speakers. And for every speaker that spoke, there's so many more that will be speaking at the subsequent round tables because um, there will not be one or two leaders all of you are leaders. This is just the beginning. Um, all I want to say is uh, I love you all. Uh, we are a beloved community. We are all an extended family, as uh, Representative John Conyers used to always say. So we want to get to people who did not have a chance to present. Uh, we're going to ask that you go for about three minutes. Um, and again, it's real simple. Well, you know, what are you working on, and what do we need to do to win whatever it is that you're working on? So I'm going to call on my dear friend, Wendy Lederman from the uh, Fort Lauderdale, Miami area. And Wendy represents the best of the best. One of the things that we're being very intentional about is making sure that we not only include people who are in DC in the Beltway, but also all the leaders in 435 congressional districts and 50 states and the territories and our global partners, because we're gonna have to be a global movement to transition to 100% clean renewable energy. It's not gonna be easy to get India, China, and Russia, and the G8 and developing countries to transition. We don't have but about 10 years, maybe less to get our carbon footprint down. So how we organize will determine whether or not we survive climate change. I know that's hard to put our arms around, but we do have time to cool the planet down, but we cannot do that unless we are unified. Wendy Lederman, the floor is yours, please. Thank you. Thank you so much. Like, wonderful. So much love to you guys. This is amazing. I'll try to be really quick. Okay. Um, so, uh, and I have so much I want to say. So, um, I, I feel like it's important to, um, to normalize um, civic engagement for everyone. It's, um, it should be a responsibility, like, for, like, taking out the trash, you know, and I kind of see the revolution is happening by like a bunch of enlightened but tired individuals. Um, and you know, just making it normal to call your um, representatives and your commission and just, you know, thinking outside of ourselves, you know, like everyday people, you know, Socrates said something like the only time people get involved in politics is when they don't wanna be ruled by lesser men or women. Um, so yeah, like um, all of our talents and all of our skills with all of our diversities, we're all, we're all puzzle pieces. And the puzzle in itself, when it comes together, is the picture that we want to see for the future. And we really need to just visualize that every day until we manifest it and hold that vision and be grateful to serve and be a positive in that and not get stuck in the, the doom and gloom. Jack Lieberman said, um, don't mourn, organize, you know, mm. so um, right. we just really need to hold that picture every day and be grateful. Um, I, I do kind of want to just say a quick thing about what's going on in Fort Lauderdale, kind of a water protector here just out of default, um, but it's a microcosm because, you know, an injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. So, um, oh, and I do want to say about the organizing too is um, getting the artists and musicians involved because there's, that's the reason that things are censored is because they're the ones that really infuse the ideas and, um, and people as well. So that's a huge start for the voice of the culture is to just get everyone, everyone engaged. So in Fort Lauderdale, um, just before COVID, we had a series of sewage spills where we actually had more raw untreated sewage in the streets and in the, the rivers than the Gulf had oil in 2011. And the corruption 
and um, collusion of our local government was so obnoxious that I, I started a, a forum for the water, the Fort Lauderdale Water Crisis Community Forum, just so people could share information if they knew when like the water was safe to go near or drink or anywhere. And so that this has evolved and this is what ties all of our issues together, right? So now we're looking at like overdevelopment and the, like saltwater intrusion, erosion, pollution, but then you start seeing these land grabs where all of our infrastructure, all of our, um, our, our our land, the last of our land, our green spaces is being bought up by foreign investors and they flip a profit while we literally sink away. But they're also taking public land as well, which is just totally a fascist takeover. But the underbelly of it, what really happens is now that we have these land grabs, you have these slum lords that have all these uninhabitable situations. So you have people like me who's actually getting sued by my last landlord because I complained about uninhabitable situations. And it's really disgusting because now in COVID, you have people without toilets and, and without hot water and they're being forced out rent prices are going up 15 percent within a year and it's just because people want to cash in and there's no regulation you have dirty judges you have dirty pol politicians because our votes don't count and it ends up with a really really dirty situation but again we're not going to mourn we're going to organize because the power is in the numbers all power to the people the power is in our numbers if we come together and we just create a new way until the old way becomes obsolete so um yeah all power to the people <laughs> I wendy <laughs> first of all i'm sorry about what you're going through um in terms of your housing and we know that we we're going to have to fight the supreme court which is unbelievably conservative cannot let the supreme court determine public policy that the congress and the white house should you know and the executive branch should be dealing with but to have millions of people who are about to be evicted during a COVID 19 pandemic is unconscionable and we are going to have an emergency roundtable on eviction prevention because we can't leave housing to politicians we're going to have to take you know take control of this situation i never thought i would see this in my lifetime by the way so thank you wendy i'm